Right. So good morning. I'm just going to wait for people to filter in. I can see the participants filling up now, which is great. Uh, we'll just give it a minute for people to come in and then we'll get the webinar started. Okay, I think we're looking pretty good and um, people will filter in over the next couple of minutes as well while we do uh, introductions and things like that. So good morning. Uh, my name is Kate O'Callaghan. I'm the director of the knowledge sharing team here at ARENA. I'm absolutely delighted to be your MC for today's insights webinar on ultra fast charging. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, out of your day to join us. We're uh, presenting insights today from ARENA's ultra fast charging projects. We'll have a presentation from Anna Jaya, followed by a panel discussion with some of our ultra fast charging project leads. Um, but before we dive into the detail of today, uh, I've got the ARENA CEO, Darren Miller here with us uh, to make some opening remarks and introduce our speakers. Um, before we get started with that, I'll just let you know the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be posted onto our knowledge bank in the, in the coming weeks. Um, so watch out for that. Uh, I might go over to you, Darren, for some opening remarks. Thanks, Kate, and welcome everybody to the session today. Um, as you know, ARENA was established uh, back in 2012 to help improve the competitiveness and the supply of renewable energy in Australia. And since we started back nine years ago, we've worked hard to support what's now over 600 projects with over $1.77 billion of federal government funding. And importantly, we've attracted over $6 billion of private sector co-funding for the projects that we've supported. So I think, I think that sort of uh, financial leverage that we have achieved is a very important aspect of uh, ARENA's success and of the industry's success in the areas that we've supported. Um, most importantly though, beyond the funding that we provide, the sharing of knowledge is crucial to what we do. Uh, I've said before that knowledge sharing is the only return on investment that we actually get out of the money that we spend. And it's crucial that we're building on the success and experience of others as we proceed through this very rapid transition. In the EV portfolio particularly, ARENA has supported a range of projects with around $55 million in funding to date. Uh, and uh, we focused on two key themes throughout um, our work in, in the electric vehicle space. Firstly, we've made a number of investments in public charging infrastructure with the goal of reducing range anxiety and allowing drivers the opportunity to switch to EVs with confidence when those uh, EVs are available at a price point that they're prepared to pay. Uh, we've evolved our portfolio over time. So we started out with the two ultra fast charging networks, the EV networks and ChargeFox um, uh, networks, which we're looking at today as our focus of today's event. And recently we've announced the successful applicants uh, for round one of our future fuels fund, which will see us providing uh, $24.5 million, matched by $55 million from the private sector to deliver over is collecting valuable data, which once gathered and analyzed will allow us to provide the industry with important insights and analysis on charging behavior and the grid impact that we can expect in the years to come. Today, we're focusing in on two, the two ultra fast charging projects, as I mentioned before. So we have Ezra Beeman and Eric Kotopoulos from Energia, who will be presenting the insights from Energia's analysis of ultra-fast charging project data. And I'm also pleased to have Evan Beaver, the head of charging at ChargeFox, and Bernard Canoplia, who leads Metro Charging at EV Networks, join us in the panel session to bring lived experience 
to complement the insights that Ezra and Eric will share today from their analysis. So thank you, everybody. I want to also thank my team at ARENA, who's worked very hard on the space and is doing a great job at bringing the industry together to share these uh, share knowledge through these uh, forums. So thank you, Kate, and your team, and back to you to carry on. Thanks. Thanks so much, Darren. Um, so while Eric is pulling up the slides for our main presentation today, I just want to uh, invite you to explore the Zoom Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to start sending through your questions as the presentation commences and we'll get to as many of them as we can when the panel discussion starts. Um, we've also got upvoting enabled on those um, questions. So if there are ones that pop up that you'd really like to hear, give them a thumbs up and they'll head to the top of the list. Um, so Eric, if you can bring up your slides, we can probably uh, get going. Um, and just a little background, so we're partnering with Energia. They are our knowledge sharing agent for the electric vehicle portfolio. Um, and this is the first in a number of knowledge sharing outputs that they'll be leading for us to analyze EV portfolio data. So we're really excited to be able to kick off with the first one, which obviously, because it's the first one, it focuses on our earlier investments where we've built up a bit of data for our analysis. So it looks like we're ready to go. So I'll just pass over to Ezra and Eric to run us through our analysis. Thanks guys. Thank you, Katie. Um, uh, Eric, if you could put that on, on the full screen just so we can make sure we can see the whole thing. Uh, I'll kick off with some uh, initial uh, comments and just go through the exec summary and then I'll hand over to Eric to take us through the detailed analysis that he and the rest of the team have completed. Uh, First of all, I'd just like to state that we are very excited to be part of this knowledge sharing um, initiative. Um, the area of EV charging and particularly fast charging is one that is uh, shrouded in a lot of mystery. Uh, anyone who's, who works in this space knows that trying to find information about how um, EV drivers behave and how charging um, the stations uh, impact the grid no, it's like uh, finding hen's teeth. It's just really, really uh, difficult. And so when we um, were uh, selected to be part of this, you know, we basically were uh, jumping for joy uh, to, to bring this information uh, into the public domain uh, because we think it's gonna serve so many uh, progressive interest, uh, interests in, in this area. And it's, and it's just so essential uh, for the rest of the industry being both the transport uh, fast charging uh, and in in energy industries uh, to, that will be relying on this, this information. Um, also wanted to say thank you uh, to ARENA and to the project, uh, uh, the project participants uh, for, for making uh, this, this, um, this portfolio of data possible. Um, we found it very easy uh, to work with everyone uh, and really appreciate the cooperative and uh, collaborative nature of, of the interactions to date. So thank you. Right, so let's get to it. Um, we're very excited to share these, these results because we, we, we feel that there's some very um, interesting insights here that, that everybody will, will be uh, interested in learning. Uh, and um, we look forward to the discussion um, which I believe we're, we'll be having after we do the presentation rather than uh, during the presentation. So in terms of the structure, there's the exact summary. Um, we'll go, we've, we've touched on the, the background actually, um, uh, Katie did that. Uh, and we'll just jump into the, the public charging insights starting with the, the key findings. So Eric, you advance please. So we've structured the, the, the analysis in, in three uh, sections. First of all, looking at the costs of, of public charging. Uh, second, looking at the charging uh, patterns themselves, and finally speaking to the electricity system impacts. Now, um, because of the commercial and confidence nature of some of this uh, data, um, we have used normalization um, or, spoke, or, 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 or are speaking in ranges. Uh, still, I'm, I, I feel as an analyst and as an industry uh, analyst that the information is still highly valuable uh, and, and hopefully you'll agree. But in terms of cost, um, what we found is consistent with other research that we've seen internationally, uh, which is that the industry appears to be um, realizing significant learning benefits and that with experience, we're seeing um, unit costs come down. Uh, part, some of that may also be due to just site selection, et cetera. And you know, the, 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 the 
the observations we're making um, all have to be caveated that, you know, this is with imperfect information. So we as industry analysts are doing our best to try and um, draw information out of the tea leaves, so to speak. Uh, so, so take them um, with a grain of salt, but, but still we're seeing these learning, um, these learning uh, results in terms of cost reductions. Uh, and also uh, we've also been able to, I think, demonstrate that um, one of the ways to bring down the costs is uh, through larger configurations. So that was one of the key findings on cost. Um, we're seeing some variation between the most and least expensive of the four hose configurations, which has been the, um, uh, the, been the most popular um, installation to date. Um, it's due to a, a mixture of, or what, how they vary is based on site configuration, existing infrastructure, geotech and remediation, all can impact on the costs. Um, we are seeing some differentiation between uh, urban and regional. Now that may be due to differences in, in sizing. Uh, in other work we've done, we had always put a premium on the regional charging costs just because it costs more to, 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 uh, um, to do the work. Uh, there's a transportation cost. To some other things though were less costly like, uh, like the land, et cetera. Um, and that finally, Obviously, as, as you get higher utilization, it reduces the, the per unit uh, running costs. Uh, and we're trying to um, look at the impacts of different tariffs, uh, but just given the, the, the early nature of the data, that's been more difficult. Onto the charging patterns themselves. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, findings here is just how well DC fast charging complements uh, solar PV generation. Um, in earlier work that we've done, the, and this was based on data we had from refueling stations, like petrol refueling stations, uh, the overlap wasn't nearly this good. Um, but I think this will certainly help those that are looking to soak up excess solar generation uh, and also to help reduce the cost of these sites by putting where you can co-location of solar generation. Uh, and that it, it, it may not pencil out now, um, but certainly uh, having the strong overlap of, of loads with, uh, with solar should help. Um, the actual pro profiles are impacted by COVID. So um, just bear that in mind, because this is mostly 2020 data. Uh, the patterns themselves are consistent by day type, and they and, uh, which is a little bit of a, of a surprise. Uh, we've got average duration for charging in there. Um, uh, probably not unexpectedly, the regional sites where people are driving are too far for, from home, they can't go home and charge. They're seeing a higher utilization there. Uh, and that, you know, this is very early days. These are the first sites going out. So um, utilization is, is rising and that's all, that's gonna be fundamental uh, to building confidence uh, in the infrastructure, but also to help the economics as well. Uh, and finally, I think one of the biggest questions everybody was trying to answer, and that's partly why we were doing work around estimating DC fast charging loads, is what is the impact on the grid going to be with and without potentially on-site resources? Um, and what we found was that it varied quite considerably. In one case, there was 100% correlation with the uh, network system peak, um, but it has also been as low as 41%. So the average is around 60% uh, of, of the site peak demand uh, contributing to uh, network peak demand. Um, and finally, the, um, based on the, the, the correlation with the solar, uh, these sites could uh, potentially be a, a solar soaker. So those are the, the I guess, the highlights. Um, let me turn over to, to Eric to sort of walk through all of the, uh, the, the great uh, analysis he's done and the rest of the team uh, to, to tease out that those conclusions. Uh, thanks, Ezra. So I guess I won't spend too much time on the background, but the two uh, kind of arena projects that these were from, uh, for, from ChargeFox and EV Network uh, Fast Charging rollout um, and they provided us with uh, a variety of cost and um, utilization um, data. Um, I guess that these were the key questions that we were kind of looking at. Um, and I think Ezra kind of went through it before, but uh, it's a strong focus on the cost of uh, building here and where, uh, where do we typically, where did we typically see the cost of uh, building a charging station um, come from and it's in which uh, component. 
Um, and how does it vary by size and what type of charger you install in location? Um, then we also look at charging activity uh, by a time of day, by location, and by uh, by the address of, well, not the address, but the region of the driver. Um, and then how is that changing over time or how is it likely to change over time? Um, and then for the grid impacts, which we've kind of just scratched the surface of, but we kind of, we just wanted to see uh, how well does the uh, typical EV charging load for these public stations, uh, how well does it align to kind of the network peak time? Um, so we'll start with the cost. Uh, this is just a summary of the um, charging stations that we observed. Um, I believe there may be some more um, sites that have been rolled out since then, uh, but we have data up to February of this year. Um, and we're looking at a range of charges from 50 kilowatts to uh, 350 kilowatts. Um, so here's a, a breakdown of the investment cost. Um, and you can see that it's uh, roughly equal across, across the states um, with the majority of costs coming from the charging equipment itself and also the um, electric work required to uh, to configure them. Um, yeah, the one thing that's probably noted here, what caveated is that besides New South Wales and Victoria, um, the rest of the states, I think we only had one or two um, sites for. So this, um, this trend, this isn't necessarily a trend um, that's super reliable at this stage in the in the process, but um, there's still some, I think, some pretty valuable insights. There's not much data on um, the cost, the build out cost of these charging stations. So I think this is super insightful. Um, if we look uh, on a per charging station, um, on a per charging station level, uh, I guess the, the costs kind of um, change as you'd expect due to economies of scale. So um, more power, the, the max power that's provided, it's gonna cost more, um, you know, and the number of hoses per site uh, actually does decrease the, um, the, cost of, uh, the cost of charging. Um, which I think is better shown here. So if we break it down, we break CapEx down on a per hose basis, we can see uh, that there's pretty strong economies of scale. Um, the four hose sites are more expensive than the six and eight hose sites uh, by, all, um, by all metrics. Um, and that just demonstrates that I guess if you're, if the, if the demand is there, one would be better off installing um, larger, larger uh, capacity um, stations. Um, if we compare urban to regional, um, we can see that the site costs for regional were actually higher than for urban. Um, by site, we mean the actual work required to develop the site. So like the, the parking lot, the street lights, for example, um, but the electrical works were work costs and the charging equipment itself was lower. Um, again, is that trends likely to hold? It, it's difficult to say uh, given given the amount of uh, data, it, it, but I, I would say that they'd be closer to equal than not. Um, and the other thing that might be driving this change, this uh, difference, sorry, is the fact that uh, the regional sites had more hoses installed on average than the urban sites. Uh, and that might explain why they were a bit cheaper in electrical work and um, charging equipment. Um, so here we have a... Um, 
how the costs vary over time, um, whether, whether I guess we could observe, the idea was that we may be able to observe um, the cost of the station getting cheaper due to, I guess, uh, learnings from previous installations. However, it doesn't really appear to be the case, um, which I guess suggests that there's, uh, I guess the cost may be fairly robust. Um, or I guess the factors that vary the costs, uh, there's, it's diffi uh, difficult to get around. Um, and then this bottom chart here kind of just shows, we, we take the most popular, we took the most popular configuration, which was a two charger, four hose configuration. And we just wanted to see, okay, uh, across all the sites and all the, and all the states, how, how much did the cost vary? And the answer is actually quite a lot. So installing the same kind of uh, site configuration uh, at different locations um, across Australia seem to, seem to vary the cost uh, quite significantly. But, uh, you know, the, but still the electric works and the, and the charging equipment still make up the majority of the costs and they're typically split kind of 50-50. Um, um, if we look at OPEX, it displays similar um, trends to the CAPEX in that the, there is an economies of scale saving um, on, on, a, on a per hose basis for, for OPEX costs. Um, and they are typically, I guess, lower than uh, CAPEX costs, uh, which isn't surprising. Um, and the regional stations appeared more appeared to cost more to service than the urban stations. Um, note that this doesn't take into account the actual electricity costs. Um, that's discussed, I think, a bit later on. Um, oh, right here. So if we look at the the site costs, uh, the site energy costs um, on a on a per month basis. Uh, the trend isn't super strong. Um, it, it's, I guess at this stage in the rollout, it's probably a bit distorted by the timing of sites going live too. Um, and just the fact that there's probably not enough, um, not enough discrepancy or variation in the installation locations to deliver a strong trend by month. Um, but what is, what is probably a bit more interesting is how we can observe uh, that costs on a per kilowatt basis decline with utilization, um, which I guess makes sense as fixed costs and uh, demand charges aren't super dependent on utilization, only energy or volume charges are. Um, and that's kind of reflected if we break it down by tariff as well. Um, we can see the flat tariffs be fairly constant in their, um, in their cost, time, the time of use and max demands, which uh, to have a kind of more of a fixed component. Um, and they tend, to, they tend to fall with utilization over time. Um, the max demand tariffs tend to have the highest cost, but we should add that that's only, there was only one site, one or two sites on one network with a max demand tariff. So it's, it's hard to say whether that trend would hold across um, all networks. But still, I think the, the finding of uh, utilization lowering the per kilowatt cost of uh, kilowatt hour cost of charge of um, operating these charging stations is um, uh, quite a good one. It's good to have some evidence of it. Um, so here we talk about uh, utilization of these um, charging sites. Um, and this is perhaps the most interesting uh, or surprising finding of the, um, of this whole exercise is this top chart here, which shows uh, user frequency by time of day 
And this is driver residence. So where the driver lives, whether they're urban or uh, regional. Um, and what stands out is how similar this uh, utilization profile, which is uh, just by plug-in times, it, it, what stands out is how similar it looks to solar PV. Um, so that's where our um, kind of hypothesis that this could be used to combat min demand problems that a network might have uh, would be where it comes from. Um, it also lends uh, weight to the idea that uh, these sites could benefit from installing on-site PV to manage their electricity costs. Um, but then you would need to analyze the cost of the system and installing it, et cetera. Um, in terms of frequency by, by month of year, we can, as a general trend that the winter months, sorry, the summer months seem to have a higher rate of utilization. Um, which I guess makes sense, although it, it kind of correlates with the, the holiday the holiday period of December and January being the highest. Um, if we look at the comparison of weekday versus weekend, um, it seems to be quite similar, which I think was a, quite a surprising um, result, I would have thought maybe weekday would be more geared towards the evening, but that isn't the case. Um, however, that may just be a reflection of the, of the time frame, or if we had more data, perhaps a different trend would emerge. Um, so this is by site location, uh, as opposed to driver residence location. Um, and the thing to note here is that the regional public charging sites uh, appear to be utilized more than the network, um, though the time of day and the uh, site and the month of year patterns remain similar. Um, and that, I guess, provides early evidence that these are highway charging locations or the long haul charging locations are are being more utilized for in a public charging space than the um, than perhaps the urban sites are. But again, it's perhaps too early to tell. Um, and then again, we can see that uh, there's little difference between weekday and, um, and weekend. Um, so we look at usage over time. Uh, we can observe ChargeFox had a pretty strong role, most of their rollout in 2019, with EV uh, rolling out more in the in the 2020s. Um, I guess the things to note here is that uh, utilization appeared to be building quite nicely in 2019, following the rollout of the ChargeFox, uh, most of the ChargeFox sites. Um, you can see the COVID lockdowns of 2020 have a reasonably significant impact on utilization, uh, which we then see recover in the late 2020s. Originally, this slide said, oh, you know, now that COVID's over, um, it looks like it's going up, but we uh, have to change the wording there, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, the, but the trend is generally that without lockdowns, uh, the utilization of these sites is observably increasing. Um, if we look at session duration breakdowns, so this is, uh, I think, I believe plug-in times versus um, energy provided. Um, and we're seeing with these fast charges, they're typically um, plugged in for around 20, 25 minutes. Um, What's I guess interesting is that they're not typically using their full um, their full battery to charge. This appears to be more of a top up or just a, a charge for requirement um, with only 20, around 20 kilowatt hours of energy being provided on average per um, session. Um, 
So if we look at the uh, electricity infrastructure impacts, um, we can start with the power duration curve. Um, and the, you can see the ramp up of, uh, of power is pretty quick across uh, all three of the vehicles observed, um, where top power is maintained. Um, and then it starts to ramp down as the battery uh, in, as the battery nears full charge. Um, but the, the speed at which energy is delivered is probably a reflection of the um, EV itself uh, rather than the charger. But from this small sample size, it looks to be around one to two, even 2.5 kilowatt hours per minute of energy. Um, so these are pretty significant ramp ups um, in when you're talking about uh, the low voltage network. Um, and then if we look at the system impacts uh, and we bet what we did here is we, we looked at the um, meter data for these, for these sites and just observed when um, peak demand was or what the maximum level of their demand was versus um, versus a tip, the network's typical peak demand time, which we've assumed to be three to 9 p.m. on a summer weeknight, just to kind of simplify the analysis. Now, what we found is that um, only one of the sites actually did peak during that time with the rest um, being, uh, being less than that. And that, I guess, led, goes back to the shape, that time of day shape that we observed before where it, where it seems to peak in the middle of the day rather than the late afternoon. Um, so, but, but nonetheless, even at, even at 60%, uh, this, would, this has the potential to, to trigger significant um, upgrade requirements at the network level, if not managed correctly. Um, as we saw before, the, the power ramp up is pretty significant on just a single charge of EV. Um, and the, this, uh, this graph is just showing um, when typical um, peak demand and min demand patterns are. So we take an Ausgrid as an example and just looked at when they're, um, we looked at all of their zone sub load profiles and observed when exactly they hit 90% of their peak demands. Um, and what this chart is showing is that this, the, ta the top table is showing is that the majority um, are peaking in that summer afternoon-ish period. Um, so there would be some impact, but it wouldn't be quite disaster quite super disastrous, although it's a bit early to tell. Um, what is quite interesting, if we look at um, Sapin, which has quite a high penetration of solar PV, um, and we look at when their minimum demand is, uh, which may or may not have been negative, um, but if it, if it isn't now, it, it could be soon with the, the rate of solar PV. And we can see that, um, you know, 70% of their, of their zone substations were experiencing minimum demand kind of events in the middle of the day, which is, uh, which is when we observed public charging to be the highest. So that comes back to our point of um, that public charging may actually be a good thing for, for networks going into the future. Um, so that's the end of the presentation, and I guess I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Katie now. Thanks so much, Eric. And uh, I know that was a lot of, a lot of data, very dense to, um, I guess, understand at the moment. So if you've got some clarifying questions, which I'm seeing popping up in the Q&A, we can go back and explore it a little bit further. Plus we'll be um, publishing this report and webinar um, on our knowledge bank. 
Um, but what I think we might do is if we can stop presenting those slides and bring in the um, gallery of panelists, we might get to a few of your questions. And while we're doing that, a couple of them were in relation to uh, the volume of data uh, and whether we'll be doing uh, more analysis as we gather more data. Absolutely, this is very much a preliminary look at, you know, about nine or nine months or so of data. Um, we're collecting, even as the projects end, we continue to collect data from those charges and we'll continue to analyze it and, and bring it to you. So we're gonna get firmer and firmer kind of uh, results and insights from the data as we gather more and more. Um, so this is the kind of early analysis on that. Alrighty, and um, to answer Jason Cartwright's uh, question there about the Tesla charging network, yes, if any other networks are on the line and, and willing to share some of their data for uh, you know more substantial analysis, we certainly um, welcome that, but we also understand that a lot of this data is uh, commercial in confidence. Um, so we're working with the uh, projects that we have. Okay, um, so going through to a few of your questions. So, uh, okay, so, oops, I was going to talk to you if we can, on slide 25, we had those uh, capacity, uh, the charging curves. Um, I have a question from David Maliki here who asks which capacity the charges were for the three vehicles that they were tested on. And do we know what their state of charge was upon starting the charge? So I think probably Evan might be best placed to answer that one or, or Eric. Yeah, I'll have a first crack. Um, yeah, great. I think the SOC is not known and it doesn't matter a whole lot what the state of charge was at the start because the, in general, charge power is related to state of charge. So if one comes in at 10%, it will sort of go through the same curve and be at the same point at 20%. But if it starts charging at 20%, you know, it goes through the same point. So it doesn't, uh, SOC at the start of the session doesn't impact the charge rate very much. Is that helpful? Thank you. We can chat after um, David if you want. <laughs> well, that's the thing about some of this data is uh, we get into some really um, detailed and, and specific um, conversations, which is great. Um, okay, so I've got an interesting question uh, coming through here on peak demands coincidence. Okay, so Brad Smith has said, oh wait, no, that's a comment. Excuse me. I might go through to uh, Farah. She has a question around voltage challenges. So she says to address voltage challenges in the low voltage network with high solar generation from rooftop systems, for example, in suburbs, would more public infrastructure right next to the generation source be the best option to address minimum demand? Uh, based on your understanding, would this still be utilised by EV owners? That's a big question. Um, maybe as, oh, Evan, of course. We'll oh, hop oh, to you uh, and then maybe we'll hop to some others for a different opinions. Yeah, happy for anyone else to jump in as well. Um, my gut instinct on this is that the, the voltage rise occurs when there's heaps of solar in the grid. So it's, you know, sort of from 11 to one each day. And it's, a, it's something that creeps up over time and then the voltage ends up being high. Um, typically, in theory, adding more load on the low voltage side of the transformer works against this voltage rise. But because the charger load is so peaky, it doesn't have a long duration impact. So the voltage might rise to locally, I don't know, 250, 260 volts or so. And then a charge session might bring it down for the duration of the charge session, but then it will just shoot back up again once the charge session's over. To get that long duration impact on higher voltage, you need long charge sessions and a stationary battery is probably a better way to do that, but happy to hear other opinions on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add something to that. Um, I think uh, what Evan says is, is right. Um, although, you know, when I, when I look at, yeah, maps of charging stations overseas and I look at utilisation of charging stations overseas, 
you know, we're going to see a lot more charges and a lot more utilisation. So we'll probably, on an overall area basis, where there is a good concentration of charges, um, probably see a much smoother demand. It's certainly super peaky today. But where we do see some you know, statistical multiplexing of demand across different charging stations within an area, I think there will be some benefits there. So yeah, again, really early days here, but um, you know, we'll be building a whole lot more charging stations, uh, you know, EV and others, um, certainly in metropolitan areas with the future fuels announcement. Um, but you know, I think five years time, everyone's networks are going to be so much larger than they are today, and the public charging is going to be, uh, yeah, the utilisation is going to be so much greater. So there's potential for great benefit there. All right, thanks, you two. Um, all right, a few more questions coming through, and I might throw to uh, Darren Miller on this one to talk a little bit to uh, the next Future Fuels around. Um, so Phil Brown, uh, it's very kindly says congratulations on the funding round for Future Fuels. Um, and he wonders, will there be a round two of fast charges in regional areas? And if so, when this might happen? So maybe just a little context about what's next for future fuels, Darren. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so we're still looking at the design of future rounds for the future fuels fund. Uh, so we're keen to have people come back to us with their ideas. And particularly if uh, people have um, ideas around fleet charging and uh, you know how their um, you know kind of ideas around what they would like to see with regards to supporting fleets and business usage uh, we'd like to hear about that so I think we've got an email address that's open futurefuels at arena.gov.au so we'd like people to come to us through that inbox and we can get in touch with you and have a discussion so again that's futurefuels at arena.gov.au and uh, we'd love to take that forward with you thanks Thank you, Darren. Um, so Alastair Picard has a question um, for the panel, which is what proportion of the sample charges are in business districts that would see a daytime peak with minimal rooftop PV penetration versus in residential areas with high rooftop PV? Bennett, are you yeah, I think these, um, this, this sample set of charges, as the question's referring to, are very much highway related. So we've got 14 ultra fast highway charges. Uh, I think 10 were involved in this data set. Uh, so they're very, all very much in, in highway locations. So there's none really in business districts. Uh, that'll change in the future, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, you know, very early days, as I said before, in terms of mm -hmm. the overall. Uh yeah, and I think that's where the future fuels uh, new projects that are announced last week will come in. Um, we're looking very much in the um, urban area, so we can have a bit of a look at when we get them installed and get enough data for it through, have a look at those differences between business areas and uh, residential areas. So it's a really good flag um, to look for later. Let's guess, um, uh, Catherine, I've I'll go, so Evan. I just spent that whole time trying to count how many hours were. Four out of our 22 uh, are high density business. All the city ones, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth are all in CBDs. Beauty, thank you. Okay, um, so I have a question here from Ingrid Burford. Thanks for your question. Um, referring to the, the data on slide 22, so I think, um, Eric or Ezra might be able to answer this with one. Um, the number of the sites is increasing and utilization across the total number of slides has increased post COVID. She wanted to check um, whether her interpretation of that slide was correct. I can see you nodding there, Eric. Did you want to um, provide some commentary on that? Yeah, that's right. Um, we accounted for uh, the increase in sites when we did these um, utilization calculations. So, you know, as more sites open, the, the greater the potential charging time there was. Um, and even accounting for that, you can still observe that they're, that they're being used more. So it's not just um, 
the fact that there's more charges, they they are on a per site basis being uh, utilized more. Hey, thank you. Um, a question here from Brad Smith. Um, he says the peak demand coincidence would have more value looking at theta peak demand as opposed to zone substation, as these are where constraints are more likely. Um, any thoughts on that comment from the panel? Yeah, um, I agree. The reason that we used zone subs is because that data is publicly available from the networks. So they, as a regulatory requirement, publish the load profiles of their zone subs. They don't do it for the feeders. Um, so without that, you can't really do a kind of um, peak demand analysis at the feeder level. However, the, the timing of this, the zone sub load shapes are a pretty good uh, approximation of the average feeder, I would say. Beauty. Um, we've got a question here from Joe Zhu that I'll uh, answer. Uh, we've got, do the charges you trialled have vehicle to grid capability and how are they controlled? So no, these are uh, single direction ultra fast charges, uh, but I wanted to flag that within the arena portfolio, we have a couple of projects at the moment that are gonna be exploring uh, vehicle to grid charging. One, we've got our uh, ACTU AGL project that is uh, testing bi-directional charging on a fleet in the ACT, and it'll be testing um, specifically whether uh, vehicle to grid, uh, like orchestrated fleet charging can be used to provide FCAS services. So that's really just kicking off that project and it'll be very interesting to see uh, the results of it. So again, we'll be gathering data from that and providing you some analysis on that one. And then on the residential side, we've got a small pool of uh, residential vehicle to grid charging um, that will be tested as part of our AGL project as well. So um, I guess it'll be nice to see the comparison between the, the fleet and the residential in that space. And we really look forward to um, bringing new outcomes from that. We're in the insulation phase for those at the moment. So, so no data or results to, to report yet, but we'll be bringing you info from our smart charging projects in another uh, webinar or event post-summer when we've uh, done a bit of testing on that. Um, but yes, for these projects, we're talking uh, ultra fast by dire uh, single direction charging. Um, okay, let's go through to a few more questions. I've got one from uh, Bradford Jeffries here. Um, it's a clarification on one of the slides. So he says on slide 17, the time of use tariff graph that maps electricity uh, dollars per kilowatt hour against energy consumption. Um, does this mean that by the time a site uses a uh, four to 500 kilowatt hour per month, uses four to five kilowatt hours per month, does it mean that, well, it does not matter how much energy, uh, additional energy is delivered to the site? Oh, I might have mangled your question a little bit, Bradford, but <laughs> Eric, I think you can see it written down there in the uh, Q&A or um, Ezra. Would you like to uh, comment on that one? Yeah, I think I got what he's saying. So there's a pretty um, sharp decline uh, in the early days, or oh, sorry, in the lower um, consumption uh, uh, in terms of in terms of cost per kilowatt, and then it kind of flattens out. So yeah, I guess I guess that's a pretty reasonable uh, point to make. Is that yeah, once you hit what appears to be around four five hundred kilowatt hours a month. On a on a time of use, the the cost seems to seems to flatten out. Um, that's what I just, I'm suggesting. Yeah, go I ahead. just add that I mean this is the time of use rate, so um, really all you're doing is amortizing uh, the, any daily charges. It's it's really when you're on a maximum demand tariff, and over time, unless there's tariff reform, you may be seeing more of these. Uh, where you would expect to see <clears throat> additional consumption to significantly re reduce the average price of power. Uh, so you've got to be very clear about this, the structure you're dealing with in terms of when you, 
when you um, bottom out at uh, utilization, or sorry, minimum, minimum unit cost. I'll, I'll just add something to that. Um, so okay. you know, when, when utilization is very low, we're very sensitive to any fixed costs. So network access charges, metering, and also there are losses associated with this equipment, uh, quite significant idle losses. Uh, so, you know, yes, you have to amortize those, uh, those fixed costs over your utilization. So yes, we're super sensitive. We are also super sensitive to demand charges when they kick in. Uh, and, you know, this is actually a real problem um, for the industry. Um, you know, we've, you know, if you look at Osgrid areas, for example, we'll start hitting demand charges when we go over 40 megawatt hours per annum. Now, what's 40 megawatt hours per annum? It's just over 100 kilowatt hours per day, or that could be, you know, four, four decent sized charging sessions. And at that point, you start hitting these maximum demand charges. Uh, and, you know, that's when the cost per kilowatt hour jumps up a lot, like it'll double again at that point. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's something we need to address, I think, as an industry and working closely with the energy industry. Um, we can see from the data in this presentation that there are some real opportunities here that, you know, the, the profile of utilisation of public charging matches the solar curve nicely. So it's a good opportunity long term to have a nice solar sponge. We've got equipment from a technical basis is quite easy to control. So when we have those three or four peak periods during the year, you know, we can control that. So there's a really good opportunity here to you know, integrate public charging with uh, tariff form and with, um, and with the grid uh, for an overall benefit. And uh, at the moment, tariffs have, there is no tariff form. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you know we're, we're treated like commercial and industrial customers. Um, and therefore we have to pass on pricing to drivers that reflects commercial and industrial rates. So I'm just kind of calling out that there, there's a need there for the industry to work together. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of work in this space. We've had some, some um, you know, progress in Victoria, which has been really good, but we've still got a number of barriers in particular in New South Wales to address. One thing I might add there um, is I think a good news story is that there are a lot of uh, overseas examples that could be looked at. Uh, the trend certainly in North America uh, is, uh, and also in Europe uh, from memory, uh, is to look at these loads as a new class um, and to have crafted uh, rate designs, tariff designs uh, that are better suited uh, to this type of load while still providing cost reflectivity. Thanks team. Um, so I've got a question here from uh, Mark Beck. So it's an interesting one. Uh, is the use of AC charges on our highways an option at all? Um, and then a bit of a comment, I suppose the challenge is network capacity constraints in very remote locations. Any thoughts from the team on that? Thank you, yeah. Evan. I'll have a shot. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about AC charges a lot lately. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of call for them coming from Victoria and South Australia with their grant programs. Um, yes, it's an option, but it is usually an option that I shy away from. Um, as you say, there's capacity constraints in remote locations and it costs a bit of money to build in a remote location. A um, couple of things, we're finding that the AC charges above about seven kilowatts aren't much good to anyone. You know, if you put in a 22 kilowatt AC charger, there's a few Teslas from 2014 that can use that much power, but, but most of the cars on the road don't, don't use that. But if you were to say, put a 25 kilowatt DC charger in instead, every car that can DC charge can use that full load. So yeah, look, the, the options there, we tend to shy away for it, from it because I think you get better service value to customers with DC charges. Um, but I, I do, I will concede, I like AC charges as a sort of a fallback, particularly in remote locations. So imagine if, um, I say we've got a site in Gundagai, which is behind Oliver's there. If the transformer fails or something else happens, that site won't have any electricity and someone could get stranded. 
it's good in regional areas to have a backup AC charger at, say, the local motel or something, and it, preferably on a different low voltage circuit. Um, that's what we tried to do a little bit back at Tesla back in the day, 2015 times. Um, but yeah, I think cheap DC chargers are coming through now, and I think we'll see AC drop off and low power cheap DC start to replace them. Mm. Is that something that you've been considering, Bernard? Uh, look, I, I think what Evan said is spot on. Um, AC has a place. Uh, for us, its place is not on the highway. Um, it is it is in those destinations where you'll be naturally parking your car for, you know, four, six, eight hours. So workplaces, homes, motels, all of, all of those places, it really makes sense to have AC and, and DC would often be a wasted asset in those places because cars park there for a long period of time. On the highways where the natural parking duration is you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe 45 if it's uh, next to some shops, um, yeah, AC doesn't really deliver any benefit. It's, it's going to deliver someone 30 kilometres of range in that time frame. So all you're doing is providing a, a priority parking bay and um, your parking bays are hard to come by. So, yeah, no, definitely AC has a, has a place. Uh, it's, you've got to look at all of the different driver use cases to make sure you're aligning the technology you know, with the driver needs. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Brad Smart that's really interesting. Uh, do you think that charge time behaviour is distorted by the early adopter demographic and that this would change once EVs become far more common and replace lower cost vehicles. Um, I think that's a really interesting one. And uh, I know that in a lot of the trials that we're doing, when we look at the profile of the people that are signing up through our smart charging and that kind of thing, we're looking at purely innovators and early adopters who presumably behave quite differently from your um, mass market. But interesting to pose that question to uh, the panel and hear about how you think that early adopter status affects that highway ultra fast charging. I'll, I'll just pipe yeah. in here. The second part of the question yeah. was, um, uh, Brad, Brad says, I would not expect everyday workers to have flexibility to charge during solar peaks in the middle of the day. Um, so, you know, I, I think you have to look at each driver segment and its natural behaviour um, and how that persists over time. So there could be a, a, a segment of drivers who are behaving in a certain way today. But again, we look overseas and we see that this utilisation of public charging through the day is consistent with what the data shows today in Australia. So it does line up with those uh, solar peak periods long term and that's because there's many different segments of drivers not just you know the early adopter enthusiasts um, but you know you've got your your regular private citizens uh, who will buy EVs because they're cheaper in over time you've got professional drivers who have quiet periods during the day and do high kilometers they'll make really good use of public charging during those solar peak periods all of your logistics businesses fleets um, so there's many different use cases and you'll find that those with the greatest demand for public charging are the ones who do the highest kilometres uh, and they're often the professional drivers. So I think this is a long-term thing uh, with public charging will align with that solar um, peak period. Yeah, I'll just add something. I actually really liked that Bernard's answer there. Um, I was going to take a slightly different tack on that in that I do think there is a little bit of an early adopter uh, impact on the data at the moment, but I don't know if I've ever borne it out. I've always thought it, Bernard's challenged me here. The, the main way I thought it would bear out was if there's a correlation between income and likelihood that you can charge at home. I have assumed that there is one and that uh, higher wealth individuals are more likely to be able to charge at home and so they're Therefore, their need for public charging is probably lower. Uh, but I'm going to reflect on that, given Bernard's answer. Um, maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe the, the public drivers will probably hold up a lot of public charging, I think. But, yeah. but you are right, Evan. Um, so it's by, defin by definition today, you wouldn't buy an EV unless you had public charging at home. So because there is no public, sorry, unless you had your own private charging at home. 
because there's no public charging option. So you're right, there is going to be something today that says, you know, all these people have access to overnight charging at home, uh, all of the early adopters. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, my, my, sort of, my insight is really based on, on looking overseas and seeing what those trends are doing overseas. Um, so, yeah. I was just going to say, Ezra, you, were like, you had something to add there and maybe even an international perspective. Well, I think what they found in California, for example, is that the people that are buying EVs now tend to a, a, charge them at home because there is you can't rely on the infrastructure in most places. Uh, and secondly, they have two cars. And that's so when they want to go longer distances that they can take the petrol car out. Um, I, you know, I think right now we're looking at the tip of the iceberg. And when we get sufficient public charging infrastructure out there, and I'm not talking just about stuff on highways, but to serve all those folks that don't have overnight uh, private uh, charging up opportunities, um, that we'll see a lot more uh, charging at workplace. And that's something that we've seen become a much, much larger segment of the overall community, uh, as well as um, public charging near where they live. Um, and that would largely be on, at this stage, we feel uh, level two, and that's just daily charging, you know, going to work, coming home. Um, yeah, so we're looking at a, a tiny fraction of, of a certain segment of people at the moment. I have a question here um, from Andrew Williamson. And he asks, are there any technical solutions that are feasible to help minimize demand charges? For example, on-site solar and or storage behind the meter. Now I know I'm gonna throw straight to Evan on this one because I know you've done a lot of work with um, integrated solar and batteries and you've been through the whole uh, shebang with that. Um, so would you like to kind of reflect on your experiences of those different site setups that you have? Yeah, thanks for the throwdown there, Andrew. That's a good one to hit. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say, yes, there are. Um, there are two that I really like and three, solar gets included as a third, I guess, given that correlation between public charging and the solar curve. Um, so the first one is we, we did this at Gundagai and it's a way to manage CapEx, but also potentially manage demand charges in future. And that's what we did a, a dynamic connection agreement. So there's a transformer there that has a Tesla charging station that I built years ago on it. Um, and then we've also connected a ChargeFox site to the same transformer. Now, in theory, if our loads coincide, there will be a one megawatt, megawatt demand on a half megawatt transformer and it'll blow up. Um, statistically, that's incredibly unlikely. And so we have a system where we are allowed to use from the transformer whatever Tesla is using, sorry, what the transformer load uh, rating minus whatever Tesla is using in real time. So if it's a 500 kVA transformer, Tesla is using 200, we have permission to use 300 kVA and we can change that every five seconds. Now that system's based on the OCPP data set, which is what controls charges. It's got a set of commands in there explicitly for demand management. So we could take that same system and rather than responding to what we see measured at the transformer, we could respond to demand tariffs or, or we could set a, um, a number of steps on the time of day on what the power is available. So it's a long way of saying, yes, there's one, one method which is with software and using the OP, OCPP protocol that already exists. Um, we've had quite good success with batteries, limited success at Euroa for reasons that I can talk about offline, but lots of success at Gundagai with a battery that we made with Powertech in Victoria. Um, and that was very cost effective against upgrading the transformer. So the instead of upgrading the power to the site for about $300,000, we bought a battery for about 350,000. And then as you know, that reduces our demand charges over time as well. Um, and then the last one, which will probably apply on that same site, is that on a public DC site, particularly the intercity sites, if you add solar, that will decrease the demand, the practical demand measured at the meter of a site. And so 
you will statistically, you are likely to reduce the demand charge, but I wouldn't bank it. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Or maybe the other way you, that the market manages demand charges is you put price incentives and discourage people from charging at those times. Um, but yeah, interested in other perspectives there. Yeah, I mean, that's a great answer, Evan. Um, I can't really add a whole lot of extra detail to that. Uh, what I'll say is that when we, um, when we look at the commercials of solar and batteries, um, you know, solar is marginal, uh, it, it, and it's largely due to the cost of the canopy. So you need to be putting a, a large canopy up with you know, covering many bays. It doesn't work over a few bays. Uh, and then it depends on you know, that individual site and the tariffs that are applied on that site as to how much benefit you'll get. Batteries, yeah, like if you're facing a $300,000 uh, upgrade and, and it's very site, site specific as to whether that is the case, then, um, you know, then it can start to make sense uh, where, on sites where the upgrade cost is much lower than it, it doesn't make sense. Groovy, thank you, you two. Um, and I might just follow on with the next question from Andrew, which is, is the market for car charging sufficiently competitive that driving queue times is an issue? Apparently, Tesla intentionally designed its network for low utilisation rates, so its drivers would rarely have to wait for long, possibly an industry myth. Uh, is there a sweet spot for utilisation rates that will change as the market gets more competitive? Any thoughts from the panel on that one? It's a really interesting question. Uh, there's, in some areas, there's a distinct shortage of charging infrastructure and you do end up with large queues and no one likes that. Um, that'll become more and more of a problem over time and we'll become better and better at understanding you know, what that sweet spot is for utilisation. But right now, the situation is we've got a, a very you know, fragmented uh, network of charging stations across the country. Uh, although, you know, we're way ahead of where we were a few years ago. Uh, the, yeah, I, I think it, it needs to play out. Um, we need utilisation to be at a certain level to make money or get any sort of return off, off infrastructure. Uh, and you know, there will be a utilisation rate that results in queuing. And, uh, you know, I think what we're hoping to see is that the, uh, the queuing utilisation rate, uh, or the, the utilisation rate where you hit a queuing problem is higher than the utilisation rate at which you can make a return on your investment. <laughs> I'll um, add a little bit of comment on the first part of the question, uh, Tesla designing their sites. So when I was designing sites for Tesla, there was, um, nothing as scientific as that in it. It was mostly, we're building intercity sites. We don't want to go back. Uh, we need a new connection. 500 kVA is sort of where a new connection starts. And so we sized, sort of worked backwards from the size of the connection. We're going to put in 500 kilowatts. We might as well put in 500 kilowatts worth of charges. Um, over in the US, they have reached very high queuing locations. Uh, sorry lots of queuing at some of their sites. I think there's one in LA, can't remember the name of it, where they employ valets during the day. So you drive your car up, you hand over the keys to the valet, you go shopping and then you come back and your car is parked somewhere else in the car park and charged. Um, we're a fair way off that in Australia. Um, but the interesting thing for me about queuing is that like a lot of network effects, it is very peaky. So there will be the one that I always think about is, let's say Port Adelaide makes the, the final. And then on Friday afternoon before the game, everyone in Adelaide drives to Melbourne. The Keith and Murray Bridge sites are going to have astonishing queuing problems on that afternoon. Um, but for 99% of the year, there's no problem at all. Um, something for some of the researchers to think about here is I, I'd love to see a metric for queuing. It, it's a really hard thing to get your head around because it's not possible for the charger to know if someone is waiting to use the charger. So how can we figure out if a site has queuing remotely? Uh, the person that answers that question is going to be rich and famous. 
Thanks, Evan. And we can only hope that Port Adelaide makes the grand final. Uh, so I've got a, oh, I had a question from Ingrid through, but it's just disappeared. Hang on a sec. Um, I'd have just answered it. Oh, you just answered it. Okay. Would you mind just to a good share question. with everyone? Yeah, so Ingrid was asking, um, she said, from memory, the dependence on home charging is lower in Europe than in the US. Uh, and I think I read a stat that 50% of EV drivers in one UK study didn't have home charging. Which of the two scenarios do you think is a better indicator of the likely balance of home charging in Australia? So it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, and my my view, just having lived in France and then lived in California and lived in Sydney, is that the, the my experience was that California is a is a is a um, more like Sydney than let's say Paris, uh, and generally speaking, the policies in Europe are much different. I mean, one of the things we like to point to when we're talking to uh, our clients on this topic is. In the Netherlands, they have a system whereby you, you want to buy an EV, you call up the local government and say, I'm buying an EV, I live here, and they tell you where the nearest charger is, and if there's not a nearby charger that's convenient, they go and install one. I mean, I think that's at the extreme of getting it right, um, but we certainly don't have anything like that here in North America, uh, nor in Australia at the moment. Uh, so, But my main reason for saying that is that there's just a lot more single-family dwellings and a lot more reliance on the car in, in Australia and in North America compared to, to Europe. Absolutely. But it's an opinion. Yeah. Um, so Clinton Jerd has a question here. He talks about um, the future of main road service centre holiday congestion will be interesting. What are the panellists' thoughts on this? We have it with petrol managing, stations now. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. No, go for it, Ezra. I mean, I think, I mean, one of the things, if you're going to do well in the petrol uh, business, right, it's all about managing the forecourt. Um, and the brilliance, I think, of uh, the EV fast charging, at least as it emerged, was actually, sorry, let me take a step back. One of the, the most brilliant insights was in the US was called AMPM and they figured out that they could actually make more on chips uh, and soda than selling gas, right? And so you actually turned it into a destination and added a lot of value to these, these four courts. Um, and I think um, you know, adding similar activities around uh, destination charging, like you can't do it on the side of the road as well, uh, but that can help uh, improve um, the, the economics involved. Um, Sorry, now I'm forgetting what the question was. It was around that uh, holiday service centre, um, holiday time queuing up. Right. So, I mean, your main business is not meeting that peak demand, right? It's it's making the site useful. Uh, sorry, making the site profitable. And if you can make a buck by adding another site, you know, ultimately that's going to happen. But it just... There is no, really generally speaking, some congestion's good. It's just in the electricity system. If you have too much power demand, things go, things go black. So it's a bit of a special case, but everywhere else in, you know, whether it's airlines or hotels, uh, a, a fair bit of congestion is, uh, is, is economic and commercial is my view. Yeah, Ezra, hi, it's Darren here. And I was just gonna suggest that other industries have dealt with this you know, in the past, I mean, uh, you just think about going to a supermarket the, 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 you know, the evening before Christmas and everyone's buying the turkeys and, and whatnot, you know, you, they, they would have a, a way of thinking through how many registers they need and, and ways to move people through. And so, Evan, I don't know if it's going to make me rich and famous, but I was wondering whether, um, you know, if you just monitored what percentage of the time a particular station has every, every hose used, or not every hose, every charger used, and, and if you monitor that, that'll give you an indicator. You know, you can sort of assume that there might be someone else sitting behind that fully utilized uh, half hour, hour, five minute period. And that would give you the, the insight you need to, to figure out, you know, what, what the um, unserved capacity is at any time. Yeah, I like that idea. We had a little look at that. Um, one of the things that wrecks that metric a little bit is people hanging around. 
you, you get cars plugged in for ages and and then also it it doesn't necessarily indicate how many people are waiting and getting frustrated I, i'm just, is, I'm there just a, like, is there a way to is there a way to charge people for you know you sort of you charge people for time plugged in where they're not charging like an extra penalty if you've if you've hung around and, and you're absorbing someone else's spot yeah you definitely can do that i've seen that yeah so the ocpp protocol i think that's redundant actually ocpp um observes when the charge has finished and then it flips from parking time sorry from charging time to parking time and then you can do the billing based on that um drivers hate it because they'll be uh, as a friend told me there's a site there's a tesla site up at coffs where it takes about 18 minutes to walk all the way into the toilet and get back out and i've heard of people that they've parked their car they're charging they're not at the toilet yet and the and it's flipped over to well it's time for you to move your car now oh you're just adding tension to the situation um on the queuing i was going to add on the the highway service centers um we, when I started at Tesla all those years ago, um, I wondered how long our family and our petrol car spent at petrol stations. So because I'm a normal person, I started timing us at petrol stations whenever we were on a, a family road trip. Um, and I never saw all four of us get in and out of a service centre in under 18 minutes. And that was all of the little bits and bobs. You know, there's a bit of queuing there already. You know, you, you get there and you line up behind someone and find a bay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in that situation, the beauty of an EV is you could spend that tw same 20 minutes doing other things. You, can you get there and if you're lucky and you plug your car straight in, you spend that 20 minutes doing all of the other things, walking around, stretching your legs. Um, so I, I just... Look, I'm just advertising for how good EVs are now. I'm sorry, but um, I, I think it's a bit of a balance to the congestion. I guess is what I'm saying is that you you're not doing a thing; you're doing another thing that you you choose to do. Bernard, did you have something to add to that one? Um, I don't know if it's additional, but uh, I think just to you know, reinforce that point, there's a natural time uh, that people spend at these motorway service centres and they're not designed for people to stay for an hour and you probably don't want to stay there for an hour um, so you know as as cars become more capable of taking an ultra fast charge you'll find that probably the dwell time at a motorway service centre is quite well aligned with you know the kilometres you need to add during that period and remember like with with petrol you don't have an alternative you have to take on all of your petrol there you could do a short top up just to get you to your destination at a motorway service center and then plug in when you get there because you have that overnight option as well plus we've got technology which is far more controllable um, so while the you know kilometers that you can add kilometers of range you can add per minute uh, will always be a bit slower. There's so much more optionality there and how we manage that experience uh, that I think, you know, we'll, we'll work it out over time and, uh, and it'll be okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Alex and it's around state of charge again. So does state of charge at the time of connection affect duration of connection? or do users only connect for a finite time irrespective of state of charge? I'll have a crack at that. I'm just gonna start mm. by telling a little story about how charge power works. So when a car plugs in, the charger has a maximum char power output it can provide. Let's say 350 kilowatt tritium V-fill. When the car plugs in, they start the charger and the car start a conversation. Basically, the charger says, how much power can you take right now? And the car answers that question based on the state of charge, the temperature of the battery, and a couple of other odds and ends that make up the battery management system. And so I'm just going to... It's funny, the questions disappear as we start answering them, and I get confused. Um, and so the... 
when a car plugs in, the state of charge doesn't impact the timeline necessarily. The, the BMS is thinking about how quickly it can demand power. And then the length of the charge session will be determined by the human who's decided if they've got enough energy or not. Does that make sense? Where's that original? I think question? so. I think oh, the question is what, what, what does the data say, right? If someone comes in with 10% state of charge, how long do they stay? Versus if someone comes in with 60% state of charge, how long do they stay? Yeah, was there, was there data in the presentation on that? I've seen some on that. I'll leave um, the experts for that one. Yeah, I think uh, Eric might have some info on that one. Was this on um, the power duration curve slide? I can bring it up again. That, look, that's yeah, just showing just state a... of charge and, and the amount of power they can take. Um, the if you are if you have a lower state of charge there's less impedance in the battery and you're going to fill it up faster but you will be filling up more so lower states of charge will take longer to charge up but it's um not a linear relationship okay. sorry that wasn't very simple but it's yeah and then Ezra, I, I've seen data somewhere, I can't remember where it was, sorry. Um, on So if you plug in at 10%, at do people that plug in at 10% typically do a big charge or yeah, is, is there a, an amount of habit associated with this SOC? Do people that come in at 10% typically do go longer? I don't, I can't speak to that. Um, sometimes we have to model how much we assume is gonna be in the tank. Uh, when people do the recharge um, and uh, I think you can sort of fall back onto personal experience you know some folks like riding it down to the orange line and depends on if you're in a European car a, a, an Asian car or a, a, a Australian or American car right some people if it goes to the line you're done other folks allow you to go way below the line so all that uh, aside um, you know people have certain um, limits that they will let the, the, the car go to empty. And I think with EVs, just because you're that much more aware of the higher risk, that will be higher. But as the infrastructure becomes less of an issue, I think people are going to revert to form and it'll fall to sort of petrol levels. I don't know that, I've never seen any data that, that's, that's focused on this. We, we've had um, a small fleet of vehicles running around Brisbane for a while and uh, we've got some great data from them. Um, these are professional drivers. And uh, you know, so they they've got their finger on the pulse uh, with respect to state of charge, and these are rideshare drivers. Um, they will keep enough in in the in the tank to get their next fare uh, to take them where they need to go, uh, and they will they understand when the charge rate drops off as well. So you know, they they start to charge at about thirty percent state of charge. And they stop at about somewhere between 70, 75, 80. At 80, um, it slows right down. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so those are highly informed and incentivized drivers showing a uh, rational economic behavior. Beauty. Um, I've got time for another question. And I've got one here through from Monika, which is, it's actually about smart charging, which is a bit different from the projects that we're looking at today, but we've got a panel of EV experts here, so why not put it forward? Um, so Monika is wondering if there's any analysis into whose role it is to deploy smart chargers. So I'm kind of making an assumption we're talking about residential uh, smart charging here, but maybe it could be um, more than that. Or who is best placed to do so? Is it the distribution business? Is it someone else? I guess any thoughts from the panel on that kind of future into smart charging and how that gets up and running? Evan? Yeah, so just a quick little definition. Um, we think of a smart charger as anything that's internet enabled and can be controlled remotely as a result. All of the char DC chargers that we've installed, uh, 
uh, smart charges in that regard. So they can all be turned down remotely, but can't do uh, return power, can't do any of the vehicle to grid stuff. In the home, you're spot on. There's little incentive for a homeowner to spend the extra money and install a smart charger. It might be making up numbers. It would be about a thousand bucks to get a, a standard AC connector installed. And then maybe that goes up to 1500 if it's a smart connector. So that, that extra $500 doesn't deliver a lot of value to the household unless someone, a, a distribution network operator or a retailer can come in and control that charger and derive some value. So who is best placed to do so? I think it is those who have a way of monetizing that. So if you're a distribution network operator and you have a, a zone sub that you're worried about blowing up, you would be well advised to find a way to incentivize EV drivers downstream of that zone sub to install a smart charger and so that you have the capability of operating that and not replacing your zone sub. Um, or similarly, it could be an option for a retailer to control your charger so that they can turn down the load across their network in response to wholesale charges. Um, opportunity here, it might have even been an arena um, project. Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, please. But um, ChargeFox and AGL have done some stuff on turning down charges remotely in response to wholesale prices. And there's a bit of information on the web about that now. Yeah, Evan, we've got uh, four, what we call our managed charging portfolio. So it is looking at behavioral and technical uh, and regulatory sort of responses, if you like, to see, see what happens when people have incentives, don't have incentives, have technology that could be hardware or software enabled, smart charging. Uh, so we're not foreclosing on what that looks like, but we've got a, a strong portfolio of, of four projects that are addressing this and we'll be back to this crowd and others with the insights on that program as well in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And that's probably a good point for us to uh, wrap up because we're almost at time. Um, thank you so much to all of the speakers. I think I love having webinars, but the worst part is we don't get to hear that big round of applause for you guys for your time and your insights today. Thank you so much. Um, and to all of the uh, people who posted questions today, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, but I really appreciate your fabulous questions. Um, so just a note, there's a link in your chat box to an evaluation survey. So please fill that out um, if you can. It gives us just a little bit more insight into how we can organize our knowledge sharing events um, to suit you best. Um, we will publish a recording of this webinar um, and a summary of the event on our knowledge bank soon. So uh, stay tuned for that and we'll email that one out to you. Um, and yeah, we've got the survey there, fantastic. And yeah, as we said, we've got lots more insights coming from our ever-growing uh, EV portfolio for you guys. So um, if you wanna sign up to the Arena Insights newsletter, uh, if you follow the Knowledge Bank link there, um, we'll make sure that you get uh, your invitations through to all of the Insights events that we'll be um, hosting in the future. Uh, so thanks once again um, for all of your uh, time here today and thanks again to the panellists for their work. Um, see you later. Thanks, Catherine.